Hey guys and welcome back, or if you're new here, hi, welcome, I'm Georgia and on my platforms I talk about true crime, focusing on unsolved cases, unidentified people, murdered people and I also talk a lot about history, both the smaller and bigger moments that changed humanity today, for worse or for better. Today is an amalgamation of the two, one of those historical true crime moments where we're going to be talking about one of the most notorious cults of the 20th century, Heaven's Gate, also known as the UFO cult. This cult is a strange mixture of Christianity, New Age beliefs and UFOlogy, members of the group originally believing that one day a spaceship would come down and deliver them to the next level. Once free of their earthly bodies, they would be whisked away to a celestial paradise, a level beyond humanity. The leaders of the cult, Marshall Applewhite and Bonnie Nettles, believe themselves to be older members, advanced level of alien beings sent to Earth with the goal of sharing their message, something which they also believed that Jesus was a part of. Eventually, they came to believe that the comet hale which orbits Earth once every 2,000 years, was camouflaging a UFO in its tail, ready to take the members of Heaven's Gate to the next level. And then, in March 1997, coinciding with the closest approach of this comet, 39 members of the group, including Applewhite, ended their own lives in a coordinated mass suicide. Heaven's Gate is fascinating because their beliefs were undeniably bizarre, I mean, even for a religious cult. But this was merely a group of spiritual seekers who latched on to what was popular in American culture at this time. Conspiracy theories, UFOs, apocalyptic beliefs, science fused with religion. These were all things that so much of America were fascinated by, particularly space on the back of the space race. This idea of deeper meaning out there in the universe somewhere. Heaven's Gate fused that with religion and here we are. You think it all sounds crazy, but think of it from that angle and it starts to make a lot more sense. Or maybe I suppose not sense, but you can see how something like this could end up happening. The question is, I suppose, how could two people, or just one person in the end, have this level of control over people, convince them to do something like this, convince them to be a part of a mass suicide? Well, that's something that our sponsor today might be able to answer, so a huge thank you to Audible for sponsoring this video. One of my big resolutions for 2023 was to read more non-fiction content, but when reading actual non-fiction books, I find myself getting distracted and I just never end up finishing. However, I found that listening to audiobooks on Audible has been a great way for me to consume non-fiction. As an avid podcast listener, I just find that audiobooks feel like a never-ending, informational, knowledge-packed podcast that I listen to whenever I have a moment. I'm just reading so much more now and I feel like I've already learned so much this year thanks to Audible. And one of my favourite books I've listened to has been Cultish by Amanda Montel, which is about the language of fanaticism, how cultish groups use language as the ultimate form of power. I mean, language is so powerful, and Montel explores how cults, from Jonestown to Scientology to just cultish companies and communities like SoulCycle and Peloton, even social media influencers, use the power of language to bring people like you and me on board. I was always baffled as how regular people find themselves pulled into cults when it's clearly just all insane, but my understanding of it is now so much deeper thanks to Cultish. It was invaluable in researching today's episode and understanding how something like Heaven's Gate can happen. So Cultish is my recommendation for today, but other Audible books I've enjoyed this year have been Invisible Women by Caroline Criado Perez and Men Who Hate Women by Laura Bates. I'm really into my feminist non-fiction right now. All fantastic choices for you when you go and click on the link in my bio down below to join Audible for free for 30 days. You can start listening anytime, anywhere, and even better if you download the audio app so you can easily listen on the go. Audible are constantly releasing new content. If you're looking for high quality and engaging content, no matter what kind of thing you're interested in, you can find it on Audible. Is the power of language working here to persuade you to go and download it? I hope so.
And with that, let's get back to the episode. So this is an episode that could be five hour long parts each. There is just so much to explore when it comes to Heaven's Gate. So many angles to consider, so many roads and rabbit holes to fall down that honestly I struggled with exactly how to timeline this video. I don't generally do multi-parts on my platforms, I do like to keep everything condensed under 45 minutes where possible, but also while sharing all the information I can. The point on my platforms is education after all, and this is what seems to get the most interaction from you guys, you prefer these sort of 45 minute episodes. All of this is to say that whilst there is so much to explore with Heaven's Gate, this episode, whilst doing the best I can, is really only scratching the surface of this cult. And I would implore you to do more research if this interests you. There are so many rabbit holes to fall down here. I suppose this story starts with a man called Marshall Applewhite who was born in Spur, Texas in May 1931 as the son of a Presbyterian minister. As you can probably guess, his childhood was incredibly religious. Good old religious trauma always seems to peek its head in cases such as this one. In 1952, he received a bachelor's degree in philosophy before going on to study theology in the hopes of becoming a minister, but ultimately he realised that wasn't for him. His passion was music. Applewhite was said to be quite a talented baritone and even sang with the Grand Houston Opera at one point. So instead, after a very brief period drafted in the US Army, he got a master's degree in music and went on to teach at Houston's University of St. Thomas. By this point, many years had passed, he was obviously now a full adult, he was married and had two children. But whilst teaching at the university, he got involved in a relationship with a male student. And from there, his whole life crumbled around him. Although people do try to argue this, the general consensus very much has always been that Marshall Applewhite was a gay man. And growing up in a religious household, going on to religious universities and education, this would not have been accepted. So he married a woman as was expected of him and went on to have two children. He did what he was supposed to do, what people expected him to do. But this is something that you will see pop up time and time again in the story of Heaven's Gate, this repression, denial of sexuality. So with the Catholic University finding out about his relationship with a male student, both student and male, neither looking particularly great for him, he was fired from his position as a music professor in 1970. According to the Washington Post, they cited their reason for the firing as health problems of an emotional nature. And then obviously with his wife of 16 years finding out about the affair, she also left him. According to many, many people, both former cult members and people who have researched Applewhite intensely, the following year he checked into a psychiatric hospital and asked to be cured of his homosexuality. And this was obviously in a time when homosexuality was believed to be a psychiatric illness. It was believed that it could be cured. Sources also say that he started hearing voices and was suffering deeply with depression in this time as well, so he was just generally not okay. And it's thought to be in hospital that Applewhite met a woman called Bonnie Nettles, although it is unclear if it was whilst he was in there himself or if he was just there visiting a friend. Applewhite would later write about their eyes locking as they entered the room, knowing in that moment that they shared the secrets of the universe, that their souls were connected. But also Applewhite was known for hyperbole, he exaggerated everything. Everything to him was just this amazing moment of fate, whereas really it was just two people meeting who got on really well, but were actually very bad for one another. Now Nettles' kids do dispute that they met in hospital, instead they insist that they met at the Houston Music Theatre Centre, where Applewhite was a music instructor at the time. But either way, around this time, they met. Bonnie Nettles was born in Houston, Texas in August 1927 into a Baptist family, but she moved away from the religion as she grew. And it's said that her upbringing was fairly normal. She became a registered nurse and married her husband in 1949, having four children together, although she did suffer a lot of trauma with a very scary miscarriage and two stillbirths before her first healthy daughter was born. By the time her path crossed with that of Applewhite, her marriage was just beginning to come to an end, no doubt accelerated by her meeting him. 
Although Nettles had grown up as religious, she was much more interested in spirituality, astrology, tarot cards, that kind of thing. She was very fascinated with the occult and had this deep desire for a better world. She would regularly do astrological readings for the mothers at her daughter's theatre company, and when she met Applewhite, she offered to perform a reading for him as well. She said there was something about his chart that was different from everyone else's, and they just immediately had this very platonic connection, and it was always platonic, never romantic. Nettles was a nurse looking for answers in this dark world, and Applewhite seemed to have all the answers. She'd been told by a fortune teller to look out for somebody just like him, and suddenly, now here he was, it was fate. She believed that they'd known each other in a past life, and they were connected here for some divine purpose. Applewhite would later claim to have communed directly with God before meeting Nettles. He would write in 1988 of their relationship that the only relationship they shared, certainly having no physical attraction towards each other, was the compulsion to discover what had brought them together. Their spiritual connection was instantaneous, and Applewhite decided almost there and then that from now on, Nettles was to be the sage and he was to be the speaker. And going forward, that's exactly what happened. It's fascinating because Applewhite was this deeply religious man. He believed in Christianity and God and Jesus, but it also seems he had this desire for a new world, a world in which he would be accepted, a world in which he would be in control of his own destiny. And then you've got Bonnie Nettles, who also grew up religious, but she was fascinated by spirituality of all kinds, but particularly fascinated by the stars, astrology, space. Nettles told Applewhite that their meeting had been foretold to her by aliens, which he took to mean that he had a divine assignment. Together they created this new delusional reality, they built their self-esteem by giving each other a place at the top of this new world, this new religion they created and very soon they moved in together. Now Nettles left the children with their father and Applewhite, who was already divorced for quite a while, just cut off all remaining contact with his family. Again, this was a purely platonic relationship, there was no romantic or sexual attraction at all between this pair. It was a deep and loving relationship with no sex, which is exactly what Applewhite had craved for so many years, meaningful human connection without the issue of his pesky homosexuality getting in the way. On New Year's Day 1973, the pair set off on a road trip throughout the Western USA, in which they wanted to define their own beliefs, they said, as well as share them with others. They camped out in the wilderness for a lot of this time, with no money to their names at all, just working odd jobs when they could to fund the next few days. They just spoke to each other, studied the Bible, particularly focusing in on the New Testament. They spoke about their beliefs at length, and Applewhite also read a lot of sci-fi in this time as well. Six months later, they emerged from the wilderness with an outline for their beliefs, what was to become their new religion with themselves as the leaders. They'd been put on this earth to fulfil biblical prophecies, convinced that they were the two witnesses mentioned in the book of Revelation, and as a result, they had higher level minds than other people. Now, their beliefs would constantly evolve over the years, conveniently adapting to any hurdles that got in their way, always an explanation for everything. They had a very thinly veiled belief that Applewhite was Jesus reincarnated, and that one day a UFO would appear to take their souls to the afterlife, an afterlife they called the next level, or the higher kingdom. The Bible, when talking about God, Jesus and angels, was actually talking about extraterrestrials, superior aliens who appeared as gods. They believed in their last days these aliens would arrive on a spaceship to take the faithful who were ready to graduate to the next level. It was an alien version of the rapture, I suppose. On July 26th, 1973, they finally came out of the wilderness, and now they know what their purpose is, to share the scriptures the same as what Jesus and the others came to earth to do. But now they had their theology sorted, they just had to find people willing to follow them. And that first follower would come in May 1974 in the form of Sharon Morgan. Sharon actually abandoned her children to join Applewhite and Nettles, who at this time just called themselves The Two. And then just a month later, Sharon left and returned to her family. This life wasn't for her. Shortly after this, the two were arrested and charged with credit card fraud for using Sharon's credit cards. 
although it turns out she had consented to the use and the charges were dropped. But the checks run because of this charge also revealed that Applewhite had stolen a rental car from St. Louis nine months earlier, a car that he was still driving around. So he was arrested for that instead and was sent to jail for six months, leaving Nettles behind to fend all for herself. It wasn't the end of the world though, because in that time he just worked further on his doctrine, further untangling the web of the theology that he was peddling. By the time he was released in early 1975, he had a very clear idea of what he should do next. Find followers, find other extraterrestrials here on Earth. Going forward, as had always been the plan, Applewhite was to be the charming front man, getting people to join, whilst Nettles was the one with the knowledge. Although from this point onwards, they didn't actually use their birth names, instead giving themselves new paired names. No longer were they the two, they were instead Bo and Pete, Guinea and Pig, Doe and T. The latter, Doe and T, would be what they would be referred to right up until their deaths, after the musical notes, Doe and T. Doe was Applewhite and T was Nettles. However, for the sake of this video, this episode, I'm just going to continue calling them by their birth names to save any confusion. I suppose this is a good time to point out as well that Heaven's Gate wasn't actually called Heaven's Gate at this time. Like its leaders, the religion, the cult, whatever you want to call it, also had multiple different names over the years as it morphed beliefs and reinvented itself. At this time in 1975, the group was known as Human Individual Metamorphosis and they'd also be known at one point as Total Overcomers Anonymous. Heaven's Gate was probably a lot more catchy. The group published ads about meetings, looking for their crew, and they were extremely persuasive with their pitch at these meetings. I mean, Applewhite must have had the gift of the gab to persuade people of this crazy idea, to persuade people to follow them. Because what they were proposing was objectively crazy, right? That one day there would be a spaceship come down to pick you up, to take you to the next level. That Jesus was essentially an alien. That Applewhite and Nettles were extraterrestrial voices here on Earth. I mean, they literally believed they were aliens in human disguise with one job to spread this message. Applewhite even told people he could communicate telepathically, giving people secret codes to think about if they wanted to contact him. And all of this somehow worked. People really did follow them. And we're not talking loads of people at this point, of course, but if somebody is open-minded enough to attend a meeting about UFOs that they came across in a small ad somewhere, they're probably going to be more likely to accept what they're being told. They mostly attracted people who were very open-minded, veterans of the hippie counterculture, religious and spiritual seekers, looking for deeper meanings in life. And I suppose that's what anyone's looking for in religion, isn't it? At its very basis. People who are religious are looking for that deeper meaning in life, a great meaning that life has to have purpose, otherwise what's the point? In these meetings, Applewhite literally told people that they'd have to give up everything. They'd have to follow their every word. And people did. What is perhaps one of the most fascinating things about Heaven's Gate is that Applewhite and Nettles didn't want to force people to join against their will. They didn't want people joining who didn't wholeheartedly believe in the message. There was no forcing, there was no pressure to convert. The people who joined them did so because they wanted to, and that's very important to remember going forward. And really, people did start to join them. In September 1975, they preached their message in Walport, Oregon, and 20 people joined them there and then, selling all of their possessions, saying goodbye to their loved ones, and essentially just vanishing off the grid. This, I mean 20 people just suddenly up and vanishing, got widespread publicity, and of course shed more light on the group as well, spreading Nettles and Applewhite's message further than ever. These people had been abducted by a UFO cult. I mean that works very well in the headlines, doesn't it? Later in 1975, Walter Cronkite even reported on it on CBS Evening News. These people really did just seem to disappear. They upped, sold their possessions, said goodbye, and were gone. You'd think that with more light being shed on their doctrine, Applewhite and Nettles would be very, very pleased, but actually they hated reporters who pride. They clearly weren't stupid. They knew people thinking about their doctrine too deeply would probably start to poke some holes in it. So in April 1976, they went underground with the group. And by this point, there were a very good amount of them. There were about 200 of them. 
They'd stay exclusively in what they called good energy states, so Colorado, California, Oregon. To make money, members would go out and sell their blood or go to Christian bookstores and ask for contributions. Wealthy members of the group were expected to just hand over their trust funds for the good of the cause. And that's how they got by. And the members of the cult very quickly became completely isolated. Although after listening to cultish, maybe I shouldn't actually be saying cult, the argument could be made against all religious groups being described in some way as a cult. I mean, let's get up the actual definition, shall we? The definition in the Oxford Dictionary is a system of religious veneration and devotion directed towards a particular figure or object, or two, a personal thing that is popular or fashionable among a particular group or section of society. I mean, cult is a term that's generally considered to be pejorative, it's derogatory, it has this sort of stereotype around it. But I suppose when you're thinking about the stereotype, Heaven's Gate probably fits quite well into that. But I digress. Applewhite would constantly emphasise to his group, to his cult followers, how important it was that they made their change over quickly so they could all ascend to the next level, that very much cult language coming in there. The question is, change what? What needed doing? Applewhite preached that people had to learn how to communicate with the next level. It was an overcoming process. People had to give up their property, both physical and mental property, for the promise of their spaceship trip to the higher kingdom. According to Applewhite, Heaven's Gate followers weren't of this world. He wasn't of this world. He'd come from this higher place, a higher place than Earth, and human bodies were simply meat sacks, vehicles inhabiting the soul. Once the members can find themselves on the correct wavelength, able to communicate with the heavens, they could ascend and leave Earth. And at this point, they were literally talking about physical ascension. Spaceships would literally turn up and physically take them, human bodies and all, into space. And in order for them to reach this level, group members, the crew as they were called, had to completely modify their behaviour. Applewhite had preached about being able to help humans overcome sex and drug addictions, points which drew a lot of people in. But of course, it went a lot further than just that. There were very strict guidelines put into place. When people first joined the group, it was this loose social group following a religion, an alien religion, it was a kind of community, but soon it became rigid, there was no space for breath, there was to be no sexual activity at all, no use of drugs, and the denying of sexuality, both hetero and homo, would eventually bleed into the denying of gender, there was to be no outward or even inward expression of gender or any kind of individuality. I mean, they were aliens, they didn't have sexuality, they didn't have gender, they were just one. Eventually, all members would have buzz cuts, wearing shapeless black shirts with mandarin collars. They referred to themselves as monks when they were out in the world. Applewhite had issues with his own sexuality, having been forced to repress and deny it for so many years, being told it was wrong, it was a sin. So he made others deny theirs as well. And it wasn't just sexuality. In order to enter the heavenly kingdom, it was believed they had to give up their entire human nature, their attachments to family, friends, jobs, money and possessions. These were all human things. Heavenly aliens didn't care about those kinds of things. Earth was simply a classroom to graduate onto the next level. When the group very first went underground, members weren't allowed to contact their families, but one woman refused to let that happen. Nancy Brown was the mother of David Moore, who one day had just turned up at her house out of the blue to say goodbye. He was very calm, he wasn't wide-eyed or erratic, he seemed to know exactly what he was getting himself into when he joined this group, and he had full understanding. He said bye to his mum and then just vanished. But Nancy wasn't about to never see her son again. So what she did is she created a newsletter for the families of those shunned by cult members, and Applewhite and Nettles did not like that. According to Applewhite, she was an agent of the lower forces, one of the Luciferians designed to stop people ascending to the next level. Anyone in government, it sort of was like this level away from like lizard people kind of thing, they believed that government, anyone in authority, was Luciferian. But Nancy wasn't about to stop, she was going to keep drawing attention to what they were doing if she couldn't speak to her son. There's no love like a mother's love. So in the end, they had to allow members to contact their families, although very loosely. 
David was allowed to leave messages on his mother's answering machine, in which he actually asked her to make sure that she printed messages in the newsletter, telling people not to go and kidnap their loved ones back. This seclusion going underground started in 1976 and the group wouldn't go public again until 1992 and a lot happened in those years. A few months after they went into hiding with these strict new rules put into place, multiple members did actually end up leaving. By October there's less than 70 members left down from 200 but they continued in privacy preparing for the next level. We know by the early 80s, more cracks had started to show, some long-term members had started to have doubts and more were quitting. By this point, the organisation was called Heaven's Gate. In 1982, Terry Nettles, so Bonnie Nettles' oldest daughter, started to receive letters from her mother that made it seem like even she was beginning to doubt their message. Terry said the tone of her letters changed. It seemed like she wanted to quit. But then, in 1985, Nettles died in Texas after being diagnosed with a brain tumour a couple of years beforehand. Nettles completely believed that the diagnosis was wrong, because of course, she wasn't from this earth, she wasn't human, she couldn't have a brain tumour. Her and Applewhite had to ascend to the next level together, it shouldn't be possible for her to die. On the 19th of June 1985, aged 57 years old, Bonnie Nettles died in hospital under the pseudonym Shelley West. It's said that neither her nor Applewhite informed her children of her illness or her death until several months later, so they didn't get to see her before she died. I wonder at what point she realised she was going to die, at what point her entire belief system collapsed around her, if it ever did. And Nettles' death threw a huge spanner in the works with Heaven's Gate. Although she was never the face, the voice of the group of the message, they believed that she was the mystic. She was the one interpreting the messages from the heaven. That was her job. They'd also spent the last decade preaching about how one day a spaceship would come down and physically transport them all to the next level. They had to be alive for that to happen. And now Bonnie Nettles was dead. She was supposed to be leading the charge here. She came from the next level. How could she be dead? So of course, Applewhite had to shift the entire theology of Heaven's Gate, now changing the belief from physically ascending aboard a UFO to now believing that the human body was simply a vehicle for the soul. The body would be discarded upon entering heaven, the next level. So really, the human body didn't matter at all. It was your soul that mattered. And this meant the suicide was actually an option for ascension, when they were ready, of course, if it ever came to that. You probably wonder how the Heaven's Gate members couldn't see this for what it was, just bullshit. But you've got to remember that by this point, the group was almost a decade deep into this theology. For the most part, they were entirely cut off from the outside world and completely isolated. They didn't have any other societal input. All they had was what Nettles and Applewhite had been telling them for years. I mean, they even had their own language they used, their own terminology. For example, if you were in the house with other members, that was called being in craft. Out of the house was being out of craft. A space of learning was the classroom. Earth was the classroom. Their human bodies were simply vehicles. There was even an alien language made up by Applewhite. Each member was also given their own unique name, different from their birth name. Members were told that if they left the group, they would face the rapture when the UFO eventually came to Earth. They were scared after years of isolation. Why wouldn't they believe it? It was all they knew. Regardless, since the 70s, their numbers had dropped from 200 to 80, with that number continuing to decline into the 90s. Those who left clearly started to question the doctrine. It became too intense. But if you were one of the ones who stayed, you clearly believed it. This started as a new age Christian sect and turned into something just completely unrecognisable. But still, there was never any bad blood between the group and the members leaving. There was no one forcing anyone to stay. And as a result, people kind of came and went. There was this open door policy. Free will was said to be the cornerstone of life in Heaven's Gate. And that was especially important in the next level. But of course, you could only reach the next level if you followed Applewhite's strict instructions for many years. It was multi-layered. 
But I suppose this is maybe one of the reasons why we don't have many ex-members of Heaven's Gate coming forward with their traumatic tales of their days in the cult, at least not really in the same way that they do with other cults like Jonestown for example. It was in a way a lot more free, people were allowed to make up their own decisions, if you wanted to leave you could leave, but this door was always open, if you left and went back into the outside world and realised that you couldn't cope without being told what to do every moment of the day, you could always come back. But daily life in Heaven's Gate was completely regimented with rigid rules. You weren't allowed to interact with other people, including other members of the group. Food was measured and weighed, there was no enjoyment, no laughter, no socialisation. You were to introspect only, you were to work on yourself so you could ascend. You could understand why people leaving would suddenly find themselves unable to cope in regular society. Group members shared all their clothes, including underwear, they removed all markers of gender, they were devoted to celibacy, they weren't even allowed to think about sex. However, they did sleep separately, so clearly there was still some concern about people getting on. There was still some layer of gender understood within the group, with men sleeping with men and women sleeping with women. However, it was also expected that gay men slept in with the women and lesbians slept in with the men. Again, this fear of homosexuality just seeps in. Let's remove all chances of this happening. Meanwhile, Applewhite is getting paranoid without nettles, he's beginning to question the obedience of the members. He finds himself struggling with his gay urges, so he completely distances himself from all men to distract himself. He then asks the other males of the group to join him in castration. He couldn't stop the gay thoughts coming, so clearly the only clear answer was castration, to completely rid himself of the human urge for sex, the standard hormonal impulses. This was in around the early 90s now, and many of the group members did indeed follow him in getting castrated. One member of the group who took on the name Trisodi explained his decision for castration in his exit statement, which I will insert now. Okay, we have Thursodi with us, and I believe that uh, you chose the name Thursodi because you wanted to be reminded of your thirst for next, no next level knowledge, is that correct? That's right. Um, I know uh, my vehicle's or this vehicle that I'm wearing is, you know, pretty nervous, pretty scared, and not really sure what I'm going to say. I guess, you know, what I wanted to maybe address more was how I feel about this step that I'm taking. And some may say, well, boy, it's, it's quite a irreversible step. And I just wanted to say that I'm familiar with the irreversible steps. And tell you what, I'm, I don't know if you remember Doe talking about that some students had chosen had proven to him that they desired to have their vehicles neutered. And I'm one of those students that did that. And I can't tell you how free that has made me feel. I've been here long enough from the time I had that operation to know the freedom that it offers me. And I'm just so thankful for that opportunity. And in all reality, I can't see that this next step that I'm prepared to take and am looking forward to taking is anything more than a clinical operation. And having seen the benefit that the, the neutering has had for my consciousness, for my ability to grow and be closer to my older member, that I can't, and full, I can't see any other way but to fully expect that laying down this vehicle is going to be anything but great for me. Before the mass suicide took place in 1997, each member of the group filmed a statement explaining their decisions, but we'll talk more about that in detail later in the video. I suppose it's also relevant to mention here that upon entering the group, each member took on a new name. Remember, Applewhite and Nettles were Doe and T. The members each took on a new name, ending in Odie, shedding all their individualism. Jeffrey Lewis became Trisodi, Gail Maida became Yusodi, David Cabot Van Sinderum became Olodi, Gary St. Louis was still Odi, and so on. In Applewhite's invented language for this cult, Odi meant child, placing him as the sort of paternal father figure here, and they were his children who followed him. So at this point in the timeline, we're in the early 90s. The internet is in its infancy, and Heaven's Gate are about to make full use of it. 
They created their own website, which still stands today. And whilst in 2023, it does look incredibly 90s, very primitive, this was genuinely one of the best websites on the internet at this time. It was one of the most advanced websites. After going underground for a decade and a half, this was Heaven's Gates re-entering into the public eye, and they used their website to try and recruit more followers, and importantly, get money. They might be alien beings, but hey, they still needed to eat and have shelter. The group consisted of people from all walks of life, some of them being very well versed in tech and they introduced Applewhite to the internet's full potential. He could spread his message and make money. Group members started a business that they called Higher Source, building websites for companies at a time when things were slowly starting to move online. If you wanted to be ahead of the curve in business, you needed a website, and Higher Source were one of the very few companies offering this service at the time. They offered to make your transition into the world of cyberspace an easy and fascinating experience. And they did it all beginning to end. They created your entire website. Higher Source in their advertising didn't ever directly say they were affiliated with Heaven's Gate, but they did say that the people in the company had worked closely together for 20 years, which knowing what we know is the understatement of the century. They were literally bunk mates, cult mates. The company got nothing but good reviews from their clients, stating that they knew what they were talking about, they had all of the latest web design skills, they knew all the lingo, they were exceptionally smart. But some reviews did say they were oddly strict in how they dressed and how they ate. Heaven's Gate were the first cult to use the internet to support themselves and spread their message. And they did just that. This was a time before don't believe everything you see or read on the internet. And their sort of like internet advertising was quite compelling for the time. Peppered with just enough information that you could start questioning your beliefs. Around this time, they also put an ad in USA Today, so they were clearly earning some quite good money. This was their final offer, they said in the ad, full of statements about their beliefs that the UFOs were coming soon. I mean, reading it myself, it sounds undeniably wacky, but it starts with the same type of statements you'd hear in any religious advertisement. It reads, the human kingdom was created as a stepping stone between the animal kingdom and the true kingdom of God, the evolutionary kingdom level above human. It is the soul that progresses from one kingdom level to another. Each kingdom level has its own unique physical container, bodies for the souls that reside in that kingdom level. Like, that doesn't sound too out of the ordinary, right? Like, you'd read things like that from some other religions, just about, like, heaven, other levels that you ascend to after you die. But as you read through, it just gets more and more insane. It goes on to say, the reason the term true kingdom of God is used repeatedly is because there are many space alien races that through the centuries of this civilization and in civilizations prior have represented themselves to humans as gods. We refer to them collectively as Luciferians, for their ancestors fell away from the keeping of the true kingdom of God many thousands of years ago. They are not genderless, they still need to reproduce. They are nothing more than technically advanced humans who have re- They are nothing more than technically advanced humans who have retained some of what they learned whilst in early training of members of the true kingdom of God e.g. limited space-time travel, telepathic communication, advanced travel hardware, spacecrafts, etc. Increased longevity, advanced genetic engineering, and such things as suspended holograms, as used in some religious miracles. These Luciferian space races are the human's greatest enemy. And so it goes. Knowing what the group went on to do, this really was their final attempt at finding new members with all their new income but I fear they might have come on a little bit too strong with all the spacey alien stuff. Like this ad wasn't in some niche UFO new age kind of magazine, it was in USA Today. It wouldn't have been cheap and this wasn't the only thing they did with their new money either. They were also able to afford to rent a large estate that they called the Monastery in a wealthy gated community in Rancho Santa Fe in California. It was a home base for the cult. They were very careful with what property they chose here. The location of this home was incredibly intentional. It was private, zoning laws banned streetlights, meaning they could see the stars and keep an eye out for a very important comet. 
You see, by this point in time, the group's entire belief system was focused around a singular comet, Comet Hale-Bopp, which had been discovered by Alan Hale and Thomas Bopp in July 1995. The comet was massive, but at the time of its discovery, it wasn't quite visible to the human eye, only through a telescope, but it did become visible in May 1996, and by January 1997, it was big enough and bright enough that anyone who wanted to look for it could do so, you could see it moving across the sky. This was a massive comet, with its nucleus being 60 by 20 kilometres in diameter. Its tail was definitely large enough to camouflage a UFO waiting to take a number of souls to the next level. Applewhite informed the Odies that an older member from the next level had informed him that the hale comet indicated the arrival of a spacecraft that would transport them home before recycling the Earth. He believed that Nettles was on the spaceship waiting for them. The apocalypse was coming, shedding the earth of the Luciferians and non-believers. Now was the time to act. And this very much wasn't helped by the recent forest fires in California that had turned the sky red, another sure sign that the end of the world was nigh. On March 19th and 20th, 1997, Marshall Applewhite filmed what he titled Doe's Final Exit, spelling out what the plan was for Heaven's Gate going forward. In that, there wasn't a plan going forward, they were going to end their lives. The video is an hour and a half long, in which he details how he and T came into their vehicles in the mid-70s. They weren't born as infants into human bodies, they just sort of came into their bodies as adults. And now it was the time to leave their vehicles. This is March 19, 1997. And <clears throat> I'm Doe, uh, some called our partnership T and Doe. That's not my name, but that's how I'm referred to on planet Earth at this time. I've been talking to my students that are sitting in front of me about <clears throat> talking to you. And let me say that our mission here at this time is about to come to a close in the next few days. <clears throat> we came from distant space and even what some might call somewhat of another dimension and we're about to return from whence we came and I'd say that when we say we came from distant space that we're talking about what your religious literature would call the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God I'm afraid I have to give you, we have a website and on that website called Heaven's Gate, uh, we have a little category in there that you can key on and it says what we believe concerning suicide or why we're against suicide or I don't remember the exact title. But it explains that to us suicide is when you have had life because you've connected with, you have received mind from the kingdom level above human and you have been given that awakening mind so that you are aware of the truth about that kingdom level and therefore have an opportunity to move out of the human kingdom into that kingdom level. And then when you turn against that or when you cannot do what is required to identify with the mind and not with the body, can identify as something that is of that kingdom and not of this kingdom. If you can succeed at that and find no value of life here, but see this only as a training ground and as a stepping stone to move into that kingdom level, when if that can occur to you, then you can go into that kingdom. And like I said earlier, or a few minutes ago, that is periodically offered. It seems that Applewhite very much believed his own message. I mean, he had to. He had convinced himself over the years that this really was reality. He hated his own body. He'd been taught to hate it growing up gay in a religious family. And those thoughts had snowballed out of control. There must have been some sort of level of psychosis or something going on. I don't mean to diagnose him with anything. But, like, sane people don't truly, in their hearts, believe this. 
or at least they don't peddle it to other people and create a whole cult and convince people to end their own lives in a mass suicide. Like, something was going on. In Applewhite's mind, he could leave this sinful body and in death, find another world in which he would be accepted. And Applewhite wasn't the only Heaven's Gate member to film an exit video and exit statement. Every single member of the group did so. There's no trauma, there's no fighting, no question over what they're about to do, although there are a few tears. Each member sits there in front of the camera and tells their version of the story, all seemingly at peace with what they're about to do, ascend to what they believed was heaven. Okay, we have Janori and Livori with us today. Livori on the left, Janori on the right. There. How long have the two of you been in this classroom circumstance? Well, uh, Janori and I, uh, both these vehicles ended up being a couple that were in Oregon in 1975. And we took these two vehicles uh, you've probably heard of the news media story in 75 about a bunch of people disappearing from Walport, Oregon. Well, we're still here, <laughs> and not for long. Um, we're very happy and proud to have been members of Tito's class, and couldn't be happier about what we're about to do. <laughs> Doubt was never an issue. Uh, certainly, at times, temptations of the vehicle or dumb influences might turn our heads for this reason or that, but there's always a deep down knowing that from the moment of seeing T and know that this is why I'm here to take this vehicle and do this task. Okay, we have Destody with us, and Destody, how long have you been in this classroom circumstance? Oh, since March of 76, that would be... 21 years. Okay, and uh, you, so you met Tian Do at that time, in, in, or did you attend a meeting? How did you find out about them? Well, that's a long story, but suffice to say that when I heard the information, I was overwhelmed. I uh, individually searched for Tian Do. <clears throat> because I didn't make a meeting. And after about a month, I found it. It's hard to express in human language what we know or what we feel from what we've learned in the classroom. And I'm no exception. I'm having a very difficult time. And uh, I'll try to express uh, exactly what I feel. Tian Do were two individuals that were known to, or were said to have come from the next level with information to, for humans on how to get out of this kingdom level into their kingdom level. Overwhelmed was a word that I used to express what went on with my psychic, with my physical body, with everything, just hearing that. It's something that I felt very close to, very dear to, and very important. And it answered a lot of things that I was asking consciously and subconsciously, which were things like, what's next for me? What is life about? What, why am I here? Uh, uh, what is the meaning of life? Okay, we have Presody with us now, and we understand that you have something you'd like to say. Yes, I do. Um, I prepared a little statement for any in the world who might be interested in why I'm ready to go to the next level. And I hope that this will explain what it means to me. First of all, I consider myself extremely fortunate to have been chosen for this class and to have been in the keeping and care of two older members for the from the next level for the past 22 years. In 1975, I received a statement entitled Human Individual Metamorphosis. And even before I finished reading the message, I knew I was hearing my Lord, my shepherd's voice. After meeting T and O the first time, I instinctively knew who they were and where they came from. There was no doubt. It's like a knowing inside that you can't deny. 
The information that they brought us about the next level and their ways and conduct were not human ways. And it became more clearly evident the more I was with them that I wanted to become like them. Their consistent caring and conduct was evidence to me that they were from a world I wanted to be a part of. Over the years, that desire has never changed. Now the time has come for us to leave this world and to return to the level above human as new beginners. In, as new beginners in the next level. By dropping these bodies, we will receive the inheritance we have been promised of eternal life in a physical next level body to be in service to the Chief of Chiefs. I wouldn't say they seem particularly distressed in the video, if anything they maybe seem slightly dazed, but perhaps that's just the result of two decades of brainwashing, for lack of a better word there. A huge amount of them thank Doe for opening their eyes, and they mimic many of his talking points. By this point in time, Heaven's Gate had 39 members living in the monastery in Rancho Santa Fe, and even if they wanted to change their minds, it was too late. They were in too deep, it was pack mentality. Everything was planned. March 23rd, 1997 was Comet Hale-Warp's closest approach to Earth, and although there's debate over on which exact date the suicide started, it was undoubtedly around the 22nd, 23rd, maybe the 24th of March. Heaven's Gate split into three groups of 15, 15 and 9, and on the first day, 15 of the group ended their own lives, believing that they would ascend to a higher kingdom. They took phenobarbital in apple sauce and followed it with a shot of vodka, before placing plastic bags over their head to speed up the process. They did it in groups so those alive could assist. Then the next group of 15 take the same actions as first and then the final nine. This was all described in great detail in a binder found at the scene showing meticulous planning titled The Routine. 39 people in total were found in their bunks, each wearing identical outfits, black shirts and sweatpants, black Nike shoes, buzz carts and armbands said Heaven's Gate awaits you or Heaven's Gate away team, which was apparently a Star Trek reference. In their pockets, each member carried a $5 bill and three quarters, all the money that they were allowed to carry when they left the monastery. Apparently this was a reference to them leaving the planet, some people say it might have been a sort of joke between them. There were 21 women and 18 men between the ages of 26 and 72, gay, straight, black, white, all now unified in death by their matching outfits and religious beliefs. In each of their front pockets, they'd neatly tucked away their driver's licenses and other IDs for easy identification. Applewhite was found on the bed in the master bedroom. The authorities were alerted to the bodies on March 26th by a Heaven's Gate member who had stayed behind, as directed by Applewhite, to continue to share the cult story. Which is quite telling to me because he foretold that the UFO's arrival would mark the apocalypse being imminent. Why leave someone behind if you believe the end of the world was coming soon, if you believe the only chance to ascend was with this UFO coming close to Earth on the comet? What would be the point? Maybe I missed something in my research there, so if anybody knows the answer to that question, please let me know, but I, I couldn't come across it. Rio D'Angelo was the member in question here. On the evening of March 25th, he received a package containing two videotapes. Doe's final exit and the rest of the members' exit statements. It also contained a letter that said they had exited their vehicles. He then headed to Rancho Santa Fe so he could verify this, finding the back door left intentionally unlocked. Then he called the authorities to alert them to the mass suicide. Even though by this point it was only a couple of days since their deaths, their bodies had already started decomposing in the spring California heat. Deputies turned up at the scene and did a cursory search of the building to ensure no one in the house was left alive, and after they established that, they retreated until a search warrant could be obtained. Clearly, this was going to be a huge investigation, and it had to be done correctly. Ex-members, people who left the cult, said that every step of the way, they were given the option to continue or leave. No one was held against their will. But the thing about cult leaders is that they target people on the outside, people who feel different, people who feel like they don't fit in, people who don't fit the mould of what society tells them to be. 
you give people the promise of a better world, a better life, both here and in the afterlife. It's a group to be a part of, it's solidarity, it's a home. You give people a hint of the truth, or at least what they believe to be the truth when it comes to religion, and then you pepper that with lies, half-truths, distort it enough that it doesn't sound completely wild, enough to draw people in, and then they're stuck. There has been a lot of analysis of Applewhite and Heaven's Gate over the last 26, I think, years. And honestly, nobody's ever really going to know the inner workings of this man's mind. Nobody's ever going to be able to understand the hive mind of Heaven's Gate unless you were there. And most people who were there are dead. The Heaven's Gate members became completely reliant, completely dependent on Marshall Applewhite. So much so they didn't know how to do life without him. If Applewhite was going to end his life, they had to as well. But also they fully believed the theology he had created, although we can't speak for the victim's mind. We don't know how many fully believed, how many just followed the hive mind, but we can assume that most of them very much did believe in it. Even in their exit statements, they're just parroting the talking points of Applewhite, just mimicking the things that he says over and over and over again. In an essay written by Anne Lodi just one year before the mass suicide, survival requires that you allow nothing of this human existence to tie you here. No wealth, no position, no prestige, no family, no physical pleasure, and no religion spouting to hang on to any of the above will enable you to survive. They are only entrapments. It's also important to remember that members didn't necessarily see what they were doing ending their lives as suicide. They were simply removing themselves from their vehicles, believing that staying on earth was the suicide with the impending apocalypse. They were ending their lives as continuation, to continue up onto a higher kingdom. Although in a lot of Christian sects, suicide is seen as a sin, Applewhite had decided that in his theology, it wasn't. They could end their lives and still go on to what was essentially their version of heaven. Your bodies were just meat sacks holding your psyche until you ascended into space. So I suppose we can take peace in the fact that a lot of the Heaven's Gate members wouldn't have been scared as they took their own lives. They believed they were going on to something bigger, something better. And I suppose you've got to take from that what you can. I think as a staunch atheist myself, I struggle to even begin to understand this mindset, to understand a strong belief that there is life after death and you don't just become worm food. So for me personally, there's just this whole other layer of like, how can you believe something like this? But I do also understand there's people out there who do believe in life in some form after death of some other levels. Maybe for some people it'd be easier to understand than for me. This is the beauty of humanity, isn't it? Like everyone has these different, sometimes intersecting, sometimes completely not understandable beliefs. And the suicides of Heaven's Gate members didn't just end with the 39. In the months after, at least three former members of the group also ended their own lives, feeling left behind and worried they'd missed their chance. The hold this cult had over them, even with Applewhite gone, was undeniable. That fear of not reaching the higher kingdom was greater than their love of life. They lived their whole lives just to reach this next level. There's been a lot of discussion over the years whether this mass suicide could actually be classified as a murder. How much responsibility did Applewhite and Nettles, I suppose, even though she was long gone, have for the deaths of these people? Can they be held responsible when people have their own minds, when people chose to do this? At what point do they stop thinking for themselves? It's the age old question, isn't it? To this day, there are still representatives of Heaven's Gate here on Earth. If you inquire on the Heaven's Gate website, which is still active, you will get a response. 26 years on, and there are still people who believe in Applewhite's message. In the aftermath of the bodies being discovered, a toll-free number was set up for people who feared their loved ones might be among the victims. They received 1,500 calls in just two days, and as a result of this, many people were identified. Within just two days of the bodies being discovered, 30 people were identified, and the final nine were identified over the next few weeks. I honestly don't really know how to wrap up this episode. Like, how do you wrap up an episode such as this one? 
but I will say thank you so much for tuning in today. I will be very intrigued to hear all your thoughts on this down below, especially maybe the thoughts of more religious people. I'd love to hear your mindsets and your sort of like how you view this. Like if you believe in God, do you think it's more likely that you would maybe be susceptible to falling for something like this or do you think the complete opposite? I would really be intrigued to know. Maybe we can have some interesting discussions in the comments. A huge thank you to Audible for sponsoring this video and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.